Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of No Capes, the show where we talk about creator-owned comics with creators who own comics. Joining me today is Jay Sheik. Is that right, Sheik or Sheik? Uh, Sheik. Sheik. Cool. I've never heard it in Australia, so Sheik. that's my always my downfall is I don't hear anybody's names in Australia because we don't get all right. of the it's... creators here at the conventions. It's kind of a weird one for last names. I, I'm told it's German, and that's about all I know. I can only trace the ancestry on that side to right before 1900. So yeah, yeah, that's the same. I still don't know the complete origin of my pre-married last name, other than it's French Dutch. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, but... it's like, and they change, especially in America, like with everybody immigrating in. Just yeah. Like, they don't get mistaken for one type of people or another or because it was hard to spell in the the old country it just made sense to change it here exactly exactly um so yeah so joining me today is jay chic and we're going to be talking about one of my favorite ongoing comics right now uh resonant uh some of you will already remember that uh david andrew has been on the show when we talked crowded um skylar patridge has been on the show and Shoot, I have forgotten what we talked right now because ADHD brain. But uh, Skylar was on the show last year and we had a great time. And um, I haven't been able to get Jason yet. Uh, Jason, I did approach Jason Wordy last year and hopefully I'll be scheduling Jason on the show sometime this year because uh, he's been on so many books that I really, really like. So that would be great. Um, it's a really great creative team, and obviously at the start of the comic we had Alejandro Aragon as well, and uh, he does great work. So you'll see Alejandro's art in today's issue that we're going to flip through. Um, Jay, do you want to introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about your work? Yeah, um, I, yeah my name I go by Jay usually just because it's, for brevity, it's easy to spell, just the letter J. Um, I have worked professionally in comics now since about 2018. Um, I had my own book kind of um, starting to emerge called Hush Ronin. It's something that I've kind of redacted and rebooted numerous times. I'm still kind of working on that one. Uh, currently at work on a, on a crime um, graphic novel with Mario Candelaria. Uh, I got picked up as the artist on uh, The Sword and the Six Shooter with Story Worlds Media out of the UK. That sounds really cool. And uh, it's pretty awesome, actually. I, I'm, I can't talk too much about it just yet, but um, it's it's going to be a fun one. I, I, I just turned in my, my rough pencils earlier today for the, the first volume. Um, I know what I'm trying to think about it. Like, what else have I got going on? I have a personal tie to Resonant. Um, I've enjoyed this series really since it came out I'm, I'm a really big fan of post-apocalyptic dystopian future stuff uh and i like the the kind of original spin on this one that it wasn't just zombies and things like that and um uh, uh joe donahue uh the writer had contacted me uh right around this time last year maybe you know, right around last spring about doing a short that he had written set in the the resonant world uh, so he asked around, he got uh, David Andrews' permission uh, to play in his backyard, so he wrote up a script for this, this nine-page resonant short called Rebecca, uh, which we ended up doing together, and then Tim Daniel came on board and uh, revamped some of my artwork to make, I mean, he completely transformed it. It was an okay piece, he turned it into something amazing uh, for that Rebecca short that we released for free online. That sounds really cool. Uh, and, But yeah, if I'm not I'm either babysitting my four-year-old or I'm teaching my figure drawing class at Cal State Fullerton. Yeah, you so saying that before. Sleeping. You're a figure, figure drawing teacher? Yeah, um, I was a, um, a graduate student at Cal State Fullerton uh, getting my MFA in illustration. And right on my second or third semester, I got hired on to teach the figure... Uh, one of their figure drawing for animation classes and it's something that i've continued to do 
uh, you know, since the, the pandemic hit, we've gone from, you know, teaching with a live nude model in the room to working from reference photos uh, via Discord chat these days. Yeah. Um, but I think there, there's a lot of advantages to, to working virtually, too. Things that we couldn't ordinarily do in the classroom, we're able to do here. And, of course, some disadvantages, too, that we, we don't have for, for losing our space. But, yeah, it's been a cool job. Yeah, no, no there really would be. Um... I know that uh, is it. Mike Hawthorne also does sort of life drawing and anatomy teaching outside of his comics work as well. So it's it's really cool oh, awesome. seeing more of that. Yeah, I know, uh, uh, the other one, uh, Stephen Silver, uh, who did um, Kim Possible. Uh, oh he, yeah. He actually lives uh, up the road here, I think, Chino area in California. Um, that that was one of his things that he did was he opened up his his home and property as a drawing studio to teach classes yeah that's cool um i have i don't have it handy right now it's in the other room but i have uh mike's book that he released last year the the drawing cheat codes okay and i love it it's so good for my adhd compared to like a lot of other anatomy for artist books which are like all scratchy lines all over the drawing and lots of text and notes and explaining everything there's, I don't think there's any text in the internals of this book. It's a little oh, book awesome. about this big, and it's that just very crisp, clear, visually readable diagrams. And I've been using that since I did my piece for Frankie White's book last year, and it's just upped okay. my quality exponentially, just having okay. that as a reference. I'm going to have to get some more details for me on that one. That sounds great. In the chat... I just linked Mike's Gumroad. Okay. I've got a few things that I have as uh, chat commands for when we're doing no capes now, and um, Mike's book there is there is one of them. Um, I always put the guest. You'll see your links are in there. I linked the tweet where you shared Rebecca. Actually, I found it oh, and, awesome. and cool. linked that. Um, and your Twitter is there, and the comic is there. So if anyone wants to read the comic. Um, issue one is like two bucks right now. It was either 99 cents or $1.99 this morning. I can't remember, but it's no more than $2. So go pick up Resonant number one and give it a shot. You're going to love it. If you haven't read it and you're worried about spoilers, probably don't watch all the way through right now and come back once you've read the book. Um, you That's always, true. Yeah, always try to keep the first 10 minutes or so mostly spoiler free. But I cannot make any promises past that. So if you don't want spoilers, go and read it. Come back and watch this on YouTube. That's that's kind of the wonderful thing about this book, though, too, is like even if one issue gets spoiled, every single issue just leaves you at some kind of a cliffhanger or gives you enough information to just really twist with your head and then it just it drops and then you're waiting a month or if you finished issue five like i did last year and you were waiting for season two of resident to come around it was like it just couldn't come soon enough because it was just left yeah i was just sitting here going waiting oh it was painful yeah i mean it it was like a the comic book equivalent of a game of thrones season basically yeah i I messaged david immediately and going hey this isn't fair (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Where's more of the book? You son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, but th- that was really, it's yeah. a really great book. Um, so the first, I think it's, is it the first full season that Alejandro does the art for? Yeah, yeah, he did the first five. Um, her, he was such a nice guy. I, I um, forgot how the conversation started, but I had a, a Twitter DM thread going on with him for several months, and he was, I mean, he was extremely busy, but he was also very, very accessible and gave me a lot of feedback on some work I was doing at the time and was just, any, any information, um, I mean, I, I was, I didn't try to hound him too much, but, but he gave me a lot of insight into his process and, you know, just kind of working professionally or, or you know, exclusively as a comic book artist, as opposed to it just being like a sideline with yeah. all other jobs. Yeah, and that's what's been amazing for me with having you all on the show as well, actually, is, like, there's no Cubert school in Australia. There's no 
casual figure drawing for comics and commercial illustration classes here. Like, comics yeah. and illustration are very much not what Australia focuses on. It's very much gotcha. fine art all the time. Oh, boy. And unfortunately, Australia's fashion in fine art is about 10 years behind the rest of the world, so... Oh, goodness. We're kind of a laughing stock <laughs> in the international art community. And it, yeah. It's interesting. So, for me, having everybody on the show, both writers and artists and, you know, colorists has been a really cool experience in learning about everybody's process and new ways to look at producing comics. Yeah, I, I'm always interested in somebody else's recipe. You know, I mean, it kind of always arrives with the same kind of meal, but um, even working on, on uh, the Sword and the Six Shooter, uh, there's been a whole added step to the process of making this one that I've just... I had never really employed in a comic before and I'm finding that, you know, it's it's taking a bit of, of extra time at the beginning to, to save some time on the end. And it's I one of those things I don't know if I'll adopt for my own processes for other books, but for this one I think it's been immensely valuable. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I'm really stoked to um, do that more in the future. Um, and you do, and when I start getting more time to do more comics work as well. Uh, I'm working on a three-page mini at the moment uh, that was written by Ryan Lindsay, which was okay. a, a really cool. I hit him up, uh, a, well, way too long ago now through a series of unfortunate events. It had to keep getting put on the back burner because it's just a practice project. Mm. But uh, I was just uh, talking to him one day. I was like, hey, do you have anything that's like less than 10 pages that I can just noodle around with? <laughs> and he handed me a He's... brilliant three-page script. Oh, that's awesome. Three pages is like that magic number. Right? Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, since I've had time, like I had a couple of other projects on at the start of this year, finished them up and made this comic my dedicated daily art stream project. I've made okay. so much progress on it now that I've actually had time to sit down and dedicate to it. I'm like 95% awesome. through the second page that I'm working on. I've got one page left to do pencils on and then I can start coloring. Excellent. And, you know, I don't know if you've read much of Ryan's work, but he can tell a lot of story I, in a little amount of pages. He does. I, I actually, um, it was a, a kind of a random thing, it, something that's that's happened to me a couple times now, but uh, when Kelly Brack was putting together the Death of the Horror Anthology, it's going back a couple years ago now, um, the artist that he had paired with Ryan on... Um, planet heartbreak it had to back out for some reason on another and so i, I fell into the role and got to work with Ryan oh, cool. on that one, yeah which was uh kind of this 10 page i, I mean it, it's it's like a very hard sci-fi as far as the visual elements um but also very surreal uh because it's he does woman visiting yeah he likes his surreal stuff and he does it well and almost yeah, he, he does i yeah I haven't seen a single artist that he's paired with for one of his surreal things that didn't fit the story perfectly either. I haven't seen too many others than the one I, that I work, I've worked on. Uh, he's, that's another one I need to kind of see if I can seek out a little bit more. Yeah. Um, he's got a bunch of I stuff on Comixology. So okay. definitely check out Negative Space. And uh, it's available at the oh, moment okay. through Comics Tribe. I've seen that one around. It's so good. This is the one he did with Chris Panda. And uh, they did it on Kickstarter last year. And it's got the three layer. Oh man, that die cut's amazing. Yeah, and they're doing oh, one of wow. these for Wailing Blade at the moment. With the die cut cover. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've got a pin up in one of the the, um, the Legends of the Blade book. Yeah, and um, Joe actually did a pin up in this. Okay. Um, and he, yeah, his nice. I've I've got the digital of it somewhere, so I can practice coloring with it. But it's it's mint. Uh, but it's a, it's a really That's good. Awesome. It's only like forty six pages or something. Okay. And you get dropped smack into the middle of the story, but it feels like a whole damn world, and it ends kind of at the start of a new story, and it's really okay. It's really frustrating in the best possible way. <laughs> <laughs> 
in the, yeah it's it's like that like that was so good but why did you have to end it here now i want more and i don't know if i'm going to get more right yeah that's that's the other problem with indie stuff too is those those cliffhangers and then the uncertainty if they're going to get the funding to make another one if the artist will stick around to do another one or just all these different things that are up in the air yeah gotta love how comicsology times out sometimes by the time i start the episode <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get that loaded back up. I went to go to the second page of Resonant, and it just logged me up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. All right, so um, do you want to give everyone a, a basic breakdown of what Resonant is? Um, sure. Yeah, Resonant is um, a modern post-apocalyptic sort of story. Um, people living in these kind of like de facto villages or fiefdoms. Um, there are others who live sort of on their own, uh, like with their own homesteads, kind of out in the wilderness, and they'll um, kind of in the same way that you know, like pioneers might have, they'll they'll venture out to a trading post to trade what they have for medicine or other needed supplies. Um, you know, basically, it's the the leftovers of a world, and I would I would guess you know America in this case, um, after some sort of cataclysmic event, has just kind of left everything in a um, in a turned off sort of state. Uh, the event, though, that leads to it that you find out is a phenomenon called um, that come over. Um, they're sort of uh, presaged by the chirping of cicadas. And if, when a wave hits, it's this kind of like tidal wave of psychic energy that causes people to just completely feral out. They'll just go completely bonkers on each other, like murderously violent. Uh, so it, you get this, you know, like characters will tie themselves down when a wave is coming so that they don't completely like dismember or beat to death everybody who's in the room with them at a given time. At least that's more or less it not to give too much away it's like those are the those are the moving parts but the um or that that's that's the machine that makes the sausage the the, the real story is that is what kind of interweaves all of those those different different factors yeah it, it's really interesting how it goes because like you said like we know there is some sort of cataclysmic event but we don't get that whole 75 years in the future after blah 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 has happened it's just yeah here is the world we live in it's kind of fucked <laughs> that's a, i love that uh, yeah it, you know if you're if you're into this kind of fiction the closest thing i could compare it to would probably be cormac mccarthy's the road um it's a little different though and i think what what helps it out too is that you don't have um I mean, a big, big thing with these, if it's not zombies that are, that are causing this, this apocalypse, um, it's almost always some sort of, like, atomic bomb or, you know, something that's going to leave behind a, a radioactive signature for hundreds, thousands of years. Right. And, you know, you get mutants and strange, strange things occurring or people get powers from it or something. Uh, and this doesn't really have any of that. There wasn't an atomic bomb that went off. It was something that was lurking inside the human psyche all along. Yeah, exactly. Just there's for this thing to come and unleash it. Yeah, there's there's something triggering it, but it is really just our base fight or flight primal urges yeah. being released. Yeah, now it's just if everybody was suddenly operating off that that back little piece of cortex that's attached to the brainstem that you know keeps you breathing and helps you survive that's that's really what it reduces them to yeah and it's and it's really interesting because i think what is it we're like eight issues in yeah uh the eighth, eighth is coming out uh if it wasn't this week it's next week yeah i'm I gonna have to have a chat to David about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure he'll hook you up. It's, yeah, I uh, meant to I message him last night, but I was flat out, so I'm definitely keen to, to check that out ASAP because I want to know what is happening next 
the the end of the last issue really had me hanging on the oh, seat. Man, that, yeah, that that one was great. I Skyler's just been a, a magnificent sort of segue from from Ali Aragon's work. Uh, it's all it's I would say kind of seamless. The the texturing is very very similar. So yeah, you're not getting this completely disparate experience. Uh, and speaking of that, I five. love the texturing on this book. I'm gonna switch to the close up. Oh why, yeah, his, why? The yeah, there we go. Tones he uses in here. Yeah. Yeah, like the specific half tones he chooses to use in these shadows and stuff. Yeah. And Jason Wordy's colors on this were, were phenomenal. Like, I got to see a little bit of, um, I think it was issue four, when Ale was working on it. He sent me a couple of panels, you know, with this, don't tell, any, don't show this to anybody or I'll, I'll come to your house and cut your throat kind of thing. <laughs> uh, uh, but it, it was, uh, I remember it being the scene in the church where there was a pulpit anyway and i got this i mean the the half tones and everything that was all all on his end with the the inks um and that's something i he's got such a nice raw use of it. it it's um the other artist i could call out who uses it a lot uh to great effect is uh mitch garrett's with um you know like mr miracle mm, uh, yes yes Sheriff of babylon and all those um, his style tends to be more realistic, but, like, I wouldn't say that there's anything unrealistic about uh, Ollie's work in this, and his, his line is, like, really, he can imagine them without, without the color, and he's just so efficient with things, and that, that texture just adds so much to that world, you know, it just, it feels very lived in. Yeah, no, exactly that. And I love that this immediately, the first person we meet who ends up becoming, you know, obviously one of the primary characters and driving forces of the story is not only a young girl, a, you know, a person of color, but a disabled, amp like, amputee. And just yeah. such a brilliant story just about her surviving in this world and living with her limitations not thriving yeah. despite them and then even as like a you know as a narrative uh, a, I'd say like article or just something that sort of pings in your mind the second you see that page and that this girl that you've been following is on crutches and missing half of her left leg it's it raises that question then of how did she lose it yeah exactly and which hasn't necessarily been answered by the series yeah i don't yet, think it so has yet because they're they're getting to um that was the the cliffhanger at the end of issue seven was going to visit their um you get to meet one of their parents in this first issue because they're they're living in this cabin with their father uh, mm. but whatever's happened to their mother is has been also kind of set aside as just a yeah exactly and, and now existed at some point but yeah, and now we're about to find out what the deal is there. Yeah, and David does a really good job of um, planting those things, you know, in early on in the story, and then you know just enough that they you catch them, but not not so much that you linger on them too much. Yeah, exactly. And, and the I, story carries you along, and yeah, I, and that's what I love really, about really the story and how it treats Rebecca as well is that like it shows her disability and her little brother's condition, whatever it is, and that they have limitations and difficulties that they have to face. But the story yeah. isn't about that. Right. You, it shows yeah. it, but the story isn't focused on these poor little disabled kids. They're so inspiring. Or, yeah. It's so yeah. sad. They're just people living in the damn world. Right. Uh, it, just, it adds so much, like, like human texture to it, too. Exactly. I, I really appreciate that, because too often, the whole point of a disabled character in a comic is their disability. And yeah. then them getting yeah, some kind of superhero miracle cure. Right. Yeah, just token disability to call attention to it, or just for that disability's sake, or something. And... Yeah. No, I think it's it, it's never really... The, the only thing that really calls any attention to it at all is the art. Exactly. 
And I love this whole thing. We don't really get it explained yet, but the whole thing with the cicadas and how they can sense this wave that triggers this feral violence in the people coming, and they use them as yeah. an organic early warning system. Yeah, I, in, in that, you know, there's a, I would guess, a finite supply of them. They also become a sort of currency, too. Yeah. Which which becomes interesting. You get these, this, I mean, because Cash obviously no longer has it. Exactly, and one of the early biggest resources they have is something that can warn them that they're about to go berserk. And this panel here is really nice. Uh, the double page spread with um, their father coming, you know, setting off through the forest. Yeah, and again, the textures, again, is so nice. And again, something that I'm noticing with Alejandro's work is something that I think is kind of what I have discovering is very much in common with all the books I end up talking about on the show because they're the ones that I love is the um, efficiency of line. There's, there's not there's... too much line. Like, obviously here in the trees, there's quite a bit of line in the bark and stuff like that to add texture, but it's not everywhere. Really? No, I, I mean, it, you know, if you stripped all the color out of this, you'd be left with these big blotches of just blank space, which on a two-page spread could be like the... I mean, that, that could ruin it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if there's just too much open area for, with nothing to look at... But like on the right hand side there, he's created those windows through the foliage so you can see a few more tree trunks kind of growing through there to show where that foliage is coming from. Exactly. And like, um, yeah, there's enough line to give the texture and the depth and the detail to what needs to be there, but not so much that it, it looks too busy and hard to read. Yeah. And he's drawing all the foliage as shapes rather than... I, I, I can't imagine anybody just sitting there and drawing the individual leaves for a scene this large. Oh, uh, man. Foliage but, but is... Trees... It's, it's tricky. I, I, I kind of love drawing trees. I kind of hate drawing them. I've got a, a couple of... Like, I've got a, an evergreen and I've got a more deciduous tree like formula in my head. And if it's another tree that doesn't fit, say, like an oak or a... a a typical like pine tree kind of look. Um, I don't know if I can draw it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. That was what actually really put me on the back foot with the page that I'm just about finished at the moment is that the second panel has like a alien otherworldly jungle background. Oh boy. So not only did I have to draw a lot of foliage, I had yeah. to make it up. <laughs> He had, uh, this is, this is on Ryan's script? Yeah, yeah. Cause he, he did that with, um, Planet Heartbreak, too. It, the character comes to the edge of this, like, Grand Canyon on, basically, Mars, and at the bottom is this sort of alien jungle with water and fountains and stuff, and it was the same problem. I, I, how do I just not, like, Jurassic Park this or something and just put in ferns or something and... Yeah, uh, making something that hinted at the tropical, but also had things that were obviously not a part of of any any earthly garden. Exactly, and and that was it. I had to. I sort of got cobbled together some references of basic sort of rainforest and waterfall and stuff like that, and then ended up like yeah. I implanted a bunch of crystals into it because the scene is where he finds this crystal that is like a power source. Oh, cool! And then sort of looked at some more normal sort of plants and gone, okay, v what if that, but this? Yeah. You know, I, what I remember doing with the one I had, uh, you know, rather than drawing full-on flowers, I got um, some macro photo shots of the insides of the flowers, like the, at the core where the petals are coming out and you've got those weird tendrils. Yep. Because that, without the context of the petals, looks fairly alien. I remember using a bunch of that kind of stuff as reference when I, when I'd gotten to that point. 
Uh, not not for all of it, because it would have just been that one one kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it was trying to come up with the otherworldly when it's not necessarily something I can see automatically in my mind. Is that's that's a that's some tricky business. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And like, I had to like make up some octopus type critters as well. Oh, okay. Because he just like, hey, oh, here's the like script. Fun. Have fun. <laughs> and it ha it has been fun, but it's been tricky trying to figure out how yeah. I wanted to represent some of this stuff. Yeah. yeah he, he was very easygoing and very forgiving with what I turned out. I, mean, I remember and this was back, I think, late 2018 when I started on it. I know I finished it uh, around this time in 2019. Yeah. A bit, a bit. So, yeah, that was about the time when I started on this. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and then I started university, and it was like, I got the cover finished, and then uni started, and I was like, well, I guess I ain't working oh, on man. this for the next nine months. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what are you studying? Oh, I was studying fine arts, and then we left, because oh, okay. they didn't teach anything that we needed to learn. <laughs> oh, gotcha. It wasn't an amazing fine arts program. It had a really, really heavy focus on photography. Interesting, okay. Even though they had a separate photography degree. They yeah. put a lot of photography into the first year of fine arts. And then I found out that the guy who runs the fine arts first year program is the head of photography. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, okay. That tracks. That tracks. Yeah. Yeah. He was an interesting character. Yeah, those art departments can really vary from school to school. It's mm. uh, a large part of why I went to... I got my degree why I went back is... There just aren't that many schools, especially like state schools for California, that are offering the kind of degree that I wanted. Yeah, and, uh, and that's it. They were close anyway. We just wanted to go in and um, you know learn some traditional media to support the stuff that we were already doing. Yeah. But my partner wants to get into sculpture, pottery, and textile and fiber arts. There was none of that. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That. That gets harder and harder to find. Yeah, and there were no illustration yeah, classes did, either. Uh, yeah, illustration. Um, a lot of that they entrust. I know for the states, there I, I don't see that much of them anymore. But there were a few. Uh, the art academy and the art institute that were private universities that offered a lot of the more commercial arts. Mm. Yeah, the only uh, sort then, of illustration and character design classes they had here were in either the video game design class. Or okay. the animation course. Um, yeah, which although to be very... fair, the teacher for that stuff for the animation course is um, Paul Mason, Eldritch Kid, uh, uh, Kid Phantom. I can't remember what else he's worked on right now, but yeah, he's the the artist for those. Paul Mason. Yeah, Paul Paul J Mason, I think. Doctor Paul Mason. Paul J Mason. Uh, sounds familiar with the J in the middle now for some reason. Yeah, I know. Taking some notes on some things to look up. Eldritch Kid, um, yeah, Kid Phantom, and like the Soldier Legacy or something was one of his other books. Okay. Can't remember what other ones off the top of my head, but those are the main ones I can remember. And I did go to that school for games design like 11 years ago when I first moved to Brisbane, and that was where I actually met Stuart McKenney. Okay. Because um, they did have a course there that I really liked, which was illustration for design. Oh, awesome. and they brought him in as a guest lecturer. Oh, very. That's sorry, like Stuart. Oh. Yeah, he, he's I, done a lot of Star Wars is... and DC work Loaded. back in the day. Okay. Now the name instantly like rang a bell. I'm just that's getting harder and harder for me. The older I get, it's just. No, I know, I know what you mean. And there's and, a few that are that are indelible, but and that's kind of the thing here as well is like, even if an Australian comics artist is fairly prolific, mm. we don't just don't seem to get the same traction of awareness. Um, we've got to be yeah. really lucky and be like Tom Taylor. Oh yeah, like yeah, Tom's yeah. great. He I love Tom. Was, he... I see him at every convention, and he's great. But he's one of the like few really that managed guy. to, boom, and Nicola Scott as well. I see Nicola at a lot of conventions, and those two okay. are probably the most well-known Australian creators. Yeah, I've worked, 
There's a couple that I've worked with too. Uh, Christian Carnouche. Uh, I did. Mercury oh, Waters yep, yep. I've there. met Christian. Although he's more in uh, Europe. It wasn't. Uh, we did the. Well, yeah, I did the the Lost River story with him for his Murky Waters uh, anthology. Uh, he was great to work with, and then I did another with uh, David Hazan last year for the um, the Platform Comics 10K. Yeah, no, I don't think I know him actually, but I'll look him up because <laughs> I, I run just, I run a Discord server for Australian illustrators, so oh, okay, trying to find everyone. <laughs> He's more in the writing category. Um, he's doing some work now with uh, Mad Cave Studios. Oh, cool, 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 cool. Like, you're showing me a cover of something I'm not allowed to talk about yet, but it looks pretty <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I know what you mean. I um, got approached by a comics creator whose work I really admire recently uh, for some, some work writing, rather not actually comics related, uh, in, in my other field. And I'm just like... Okay. Waiting to hear back <laughs> about some more details and when there's something more public announced about it because yeah oh boy <laughs> it, it, right it's hard that's like ndas are the worst yeah like i don't think this is nda yet but i also know it's not public and official yet yeah it's like very early days so i'm not gonna talk about it publicly because i don't know what i can talk about <laughs> But yeah. um, I'm hoping to hear back soon. Um, it is like it's an RPG related project, so I'll be doing some writing on that. Oh, okay. Yeah, Good. hopefully I'll be writing one or two one shots and doing some monster and NPC creation. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to it. It's especially for the theme of it. This creator is one of my favorite writers for that genre. It's, okay. It, it's gonna be really really good just a dream project yeah oh like i couldn't believe it when i got the message because i just sent them some free samples of my work late last year i think just because we connected over D D on twitter i was uh -huh. like oh yeah i make D D stuff here let me throw you some some freebies and then like last month i get a message going hey so what are your writing rates <laughs> like, okay so i guess you liked what you saw <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome, man. Congrats. Thanks. I, I don't... It, like, it'll be a big project. There'll definitely be a whole creative team on this thing, but if I get to yeah. be, I will be absolutely stoked to be a part of it. I've been kind of on the sidelines of one uh, my brother-in-law's doing. He's writing his own um, kind of tabletop collectible card game. Oh, cool. Uh, and and he's, he's designed a fully functional RPG in the past that was actually really good. I, I played it. Uh, I mean, it's very similar to D&D &D and how it, how it unfolds. Um, he'd also created an interesting rolling system that made things a lot fairer uh, when you're, you know, rolling for, for hit points and things. Um, but he has this card game he's doing and they were talking to me about doing some illustrations for the cards. I was just kind of wrapped up too much in all the comic stuff I was doing to really dedicate any, any real amount of time to it. Uh, so my wife picked it up. Uh, it's called um, Opera Man. I know he's going to be going to uh, Kickstarter with it, I think, this year at some point. He's still organizing that. Uh, but she's been doing the illustrations for the, the base card set. That sounds cool. So I'll keep an eye out for that one then. Um, because it'll be, it'll be fun. It, it's like a satiric sci-fi. It's yeah, just got cool. elements of everything in it, like 80s action movies. And, yeah, yeah, that yeah, sounds really fun then. Comedic. I'll keep an eye out because I, I like stuff like that. And now I'm working on a couple of board games and card games myself that are sort of slow burn projects because I'm the sole creator on them. So it's like I pick them oh, up yeah. when I have time. <laughs> yeah, no, especially with the game too because there, there's so much that goes into yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Like I took my the board game to Penny Arcade Expo not last year, the year before because there was none last year um and got to showcase yeah. it in the playtesting arena there and got all the data i needed to finish the rules and mechanics oh awesome and so now i just need to sit down and do that rewrite and then do all the official yeah. artwork and then it's ready that's i like it i miss that, that that blows my mind i, I anything more complex than checkers and i'm kind of yeah, like, it's it's know, been a fun it, project, kind of but thing for me. yeah, no, I know what you mean, and that's well, that's exactly why it's only just being finished now. I started it in two thousand sixteen, but 
but with my ADHD, I cycle projects. Because yeah. sometimes if I work on one project for too long, I'll either, as you know, I can just go off it for no reason whatsoever. Or, like, yep. I'll hit a frustrating part of it where I can't figure out how to fix the current issue and that just becomes a massive block and nothing happens for forever. So I'll just yeah. sort of, today I'm going to work on this for two hours. Tomorrow I'm going to work on this for two hours. And so I'm always yeah, working yeah. on a lot of things, but it takes a long time for everything to get finished and released. That's kind of how I, I do it too. It's just having having that variety. Uh, I mean, then it's, there's also like that pressure. Because mm. if I know something is, is due you know, like six months from now, and I, it's something I know I can finish in six days. I'm going to do it in the six days before that <laughs> deadline. I'm not going to do it in the interim because it's like that date doesn't exist to me. It's just this yeah. complete abstract. I know, I know exactly what uh, you mean. And then the pressure is like what drives the performance, is what I find. I, kind of the same thing as it was in school, writing a paper a night or two before it's due and. Yeah, um, and just settling for whatever grade I got on it. And yeah, yeah. Was that? I remember those days. Yeah, it's like stuff I've carried over into my career as an artist. I probably shouldn't be saying any of that stuff out loud, in case anybody I'm working for is hearing this. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, get, getting ahead of schedule with with ADHD is, um, in fact, you know, like not even knowing that I had it up until uh, September last year. I just thought I was a screw up of some kind, but well, and that's that's because yeah, just... uh, you know a big problem with that is that all the research is done on kids. Yeah, and it actually and, and all the... presents differently in adults. It does, and and the stereotypes tend to favor the hyperactive part of it. So it's like well, exactly, I don't... I, and yeah, you know they've they've discovered that it's the two subtypes: inattentive and hyperactive. And also, yeah. what is hyperactive to me or you isn't necessarily going to be what other people see as hyperactive because, right? You know, media has portrayed hyperactive as loud and shouting and running around and jumping on the furniture and punching holes in walls, yeah. whereas it could just be shifting in your seat and bouncing your foot for hours on end because you can't focus. I've been fiddling with this exacto knife the entire time. Yep. Yep. It's just like, when I talk, I just need something to do with my hands. Exactly. And, you know, I've got little bits and pieces all in front of me. And, you know, that's one of the things that helps here is when running a stream is there's a lot of little things to do. Yeah. Yeah, I've got the other one are my fountain pens or a notebook around and I've got something. The iPad. Yep. Drawing and... Yep. Yeah, I've got my Samsung tablet for drawing. I do just all my... I'll do loose pencils in that and then bring that into okay. Clip Studio and use my proper tablet for Oh nice. For cleanup. But I don't like to restrict myself to only being able to use my real tablet because sometimes I just want to sit down and draw in bed. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I've enjoyed about the iPad. I do all my work in uh, Procreate on here. Uh, pencils through finished colors usually, even the tones. Uh, yep. I've found workarounds to get it, get it all done in there. Um which has been great because I can just crash on the couch and watch a movie with my wife and then have this in my lap and work on something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, uh, I'm tempted to get a new Samsung tablet soon because this one's a few years old because they finally released Clip Studio on Android. Oh, they did? On, but only on Samsung Galaxy tabs. Now. Okay. Only on Samsung Galaxy tabs that have been released in the last two years. Uh... Mine's the 2016 and model, have, and it doesn't support it. <laughs> I have I have it on here. Um, the version that they have through the Apple App Store, though, isn't... I mean, it's it's a direct port of the desktop app, so it has everything. The downside of it is you can't just buy it straight up and use it. Yeah. You want to use it in a professional capacity, like, nine bucks a month. Yeah. And I, I did it for a while, and I just didn't... I, I'd never learned how to use it in the past, and it was just too much to... I had too much already started to try to transition that all over into yeah, there. And I know what you mean. I've different. been um, using it myself since it was Manga Studio. Okay. I um, those days so too. I was sort of familiar with it. I still don't know how to use it to its full potential, but... Um, that's, 
that's a lot. That's like knowing how to use Photoshop to its full potential. Exactly. Somebody created like. a Clip Studio course a little while ago, and I, but I've forgotten who it was because I wanted to do it once oh, I had no. some cash handy. Yeah. I was waiting for LinkedIn Learning to do a class on it since they do everything else. I, I have uh, a free... It, well, it used to be lynda.com, but I, I, uh, I get free access to that because of my, uh, my university job. And they also give me the, uh, the Creative Cloud for free, which unfortunately I don't really use except for resizing images now, but... Yeah. Or compressing TIFFs. Yeah. I, I want to learn how to use the animation functions on it eventually as well, because I'd like to be able to do my own animated emotes and stuff for the streams. But yeah. that's a whole other kettle of fish. Yeah, that, it's, it's quite a kettle. <laughs> It is. It yeah, is. That's what, I, that's what I went to school for originally was animation, and I, I did a lot of like traditional pencil on paper, like Warner Brothers style animation. Yeah. Uh, I loved it. It was like just something I could bliss out on and just completely hyper focus and lose myself in for often weeks at a time. Um, but then it, it, by the end of three, three and a half years of doing that in school, I was just completely burnt out on it. Yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, and there's, again, same reason why I haven't decided to go, like, all in on comics, or all in on RPGs, or all in on board games. You know, like, yeah. my... I've been doing a lot of RPG stuff for the last year and a bit. Uh, and some people might think that it, it, I am all RPGs because that's been my focus for, like, 18 months. But it's just been that, you know, I'll finish a project and have an idea for another project or an opportunity will come up. I'm like, yeah, all right. I can just yeah. slowly, in the background, work on this other stuff while I work on this new opportunity that just came up. I, I think that, you know, in, in advertising yourself as an illustrator as opposed to saying, oh, I'm a comics artist or I only do, you know, game design or something like that, too. It, like, it gives you a lot of license to really branch out. And exactly. You're like, oh, I do New Yorker covers, and then I do, I did this, uh, this D&D uh, module or yeah, that, it ex to be. exactly it allows me a lot more flexibility, which is why I, yeah I only sort of label myself as an illustrator and game designer because that's pretty broad. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's like what video games, card games, tabletop games, RPGs. There, there's the there's a wide variety. Yeah, it's, exactly, and that's it. I've got some, a card game to visually enhance it. And a board game in the works. I just got my first co-writing credit up on Drive Through RPG for an adventure for D and D. Um, my first solo one is like days away from being completed. Awesome. I'm I'm really excited about that. Actually, I got to stream that. I got to stream the first draft of it uh, last okay. year in December, and um, it's sort of a. It's a, only a very short, like, two-hour one-shot it's designed to be. Just a real easy pick-it-up-put-it-down, have-fun-in-an-afternoon sort of thing. But it's sort of like a... Th mm. Not a horror, but, like, thriller comedy. Okay. You know, there's a monster terrorizing the town that you have to find and, and take care of, and it sort of stalks you through the mountains a little bit. But there's also... Okay. Two extremely Australian goblins that you can... Oh, okay. Try to recruit or end up fighting, and they're as as Australian and stereotypical as I could possibly make them. That sounds like a good time. <laughs> it was. It was pretty fun. Um, and the original villain was Shia LaBeouf before, based off the meme, <laughs> you know, the actual cannibal Shia LaBeouf thing. Uh, before all that okay. news about him came out at the end of last year, I was like, right, well, I best I'd get a rewrite this. <laughs> I think I might have missed that one. I, I, I it's you know, the last thing I heard about him. I, there was that movie that had come out about that was uh, they changed his name in it, but it was like a, a biopic that he had done. Oh yeah, I remember that. Um, no, since since then, there's been some stuff about his personal relationships and stuff that's come out that was a bit unsavory. So like, yeah, I'm gonna just write that out of my work. <laughs> yeah. Now he's. It, it, it just seems like after the, uh, it, really everything after Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, it was just like all, all of life was downhill for him. Yeah, yeah. 
So yeah. no, nothing really surprises me there anymore. No, exactly. And so, yeah, no, I've, I've switched it over and it's just a, a basic mo human eating monster now, but it's still a fun sort of romp through That's the mountains cool. and it's designed yeah. to be used with um, the company that I work for produces an augmented reality app for D&D. Okay. And so this is written to be used with that. You can play it with or without it, but that's sort of why I wrote it. Awesome. Yeah, and it's really fun. That. That, that sounds like a lot of fun. It is, it is. We've just got these little cards, and you scan the card with your phone, and then the 3D model pops up, and you can open doors and windows and stuff like that, and you scan a different card, oh, cool. and you can see your model, and if the DM wants to, they can set you on fire. <laughs> So it, it was, it was oh, really weird. fun to write specifically with something like that in mind. It was a really interesting little yeah. challenge. Yeah, there's a... Um, I haven't seen it so much in gaming, but some of the stuff I've seen done with... Uh, I think it was... I remember the brewery. I want to say it was Stone Brewery um, out of Escondido here in California. Um, somebody had done some Walking Dead tie-in beers... And they had augmented reality labels with these oh, that's zombie cool. illustrations on them, and you scan it with your phone, and they would just step out of the label and walk around the bottle. Or that's cool. You know, you get the one with the zombie killer on it, and do them together, and they would interact. It was it's unbelievable stuff. No, that, that's that's really neat. Um, I know that D and D joined forces with a pin making company last year, and they released some augmented reality enamel pins. And so, like, you, you scan the pin and, like, the eye starts, comes to life and starts moving around and blinking at you and stuff. Oh, cool. Uh, the so thing There's, I've uh... noticed about uh, Ale's work in, in these early issues is it's so dynamic. Without having to use, like, a, you know, see a lot of artists using, like, a lot of speed lines to communicate things. And there's yeah, a... no, it's yeah. There's... He keeps a very fast shutter on his camera. Yeah, exactly. Like you can see, it's all very crisp. Mm. There's so much action and energy in the little boy jumping over the log here, but it's only the rabbit, which is actively wiggling around, that really has any action lines yeah. attached to it. And even then, it's not a lot. It's just enough to portray that movement yeah it's like that the leg is bent at an angle that it shouldn't be so you, you know it's it's trying to, to get away and that's all it really needs yeah no, like repeated pause like scrambling or yeah exactly and yeah. i i forgot to mention it before when like the cicadas were going off but here you can see let me just uh, change to a close-up uh, of the top like the the really nice sound effects that they use like here the, the piece of car is bending away because it's been disturbed by the creepy dude yeah that creek up there yeah yeah i love it and i love specifically like the sound effects every time the cicadas are going off i'm trying to think anywhere else i've seen darren bennett's work um that's one of those like under under underrated positions on any comic is the lettering is it, it's i mean the best the best lettering you don't even really realize it's there uh, you know it just it, it doesn't call any attention to itself other than what it, it needs to do to tell you what the characters are saying in a, in a scene but um having done some very bad lettering myself and been called out for it I got a, uh, it was like a three or four page scathing critique of my lettering from Heather Antos. She didn't even get to my artwork. She just gave me both barrels on the lettering. It was on a pitch I'd done with uh, Jay Sandlin and uh, Sinael uh, a couple years ago. Yeah, yeah. And she ended up critiquing it, but man, it, it's, you know, this is solid stuff. And then the SFX stuff that gets thrown in there like that without it being too large or, you know, finding the right on a mono PX to create that sound. Yep. Or what letters, you know, for a bumper falling off of this 
this tipped over school bus or whatever this is. Yeah, and and then again, yeah, like back to um, Ali's lines and everything as well. This creepy dude coming out, like like you were saying before. Like, yeah. If the colors weren't all here on this, there would be a lot of solid white in this panel. But that's not yeah. a bad thing. Like I would still really really enjoy just looking at this in black and white because of the way the minimal lines have been used yeah and then the the half tones really fill in his shape as well so it, on a blank white like this he's still a very dominant shape e yeah there. exactly and like the the sort of um the but way that's... that the shadows have been done instead of necessarily solid blocks of black there's like a lot of lines giving the impression of a solid block. Yeah, he, he, does, he uses a lot of gradient for shadows. There's not as much spot blocking as you see in... Um, I mean, I guess there's a bit in the underside of the bus, just by nature of what that is, because it looks like it's been torched out a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah he, he does such a great job with this. You know, like, the guy's just walking along, and then all of a sudden, Iggy pop, pops out from behind this bus. Yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> even like, here, when you look at that... Timed and, right? Uh, even when you look closer at that spot black on the bus, it's only really that central spot behind our main character here that has proper, solid spot black. A lot of it is vertical yeah, lines. But, you know, when you step yeah, it, back, it looks like a solid chunk. It does. And it's really, I mean, it seems like it's done there. I mean, it, 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 was, a, it was a smart move to make. Is if you had all that that engine detailing under, you know, contrasting the character, a lot of that could blend into the wrinkles on his shirt. You get tangents and uh, white setting where a lot of this would, would tend to flatten out a bit. Yeah, exactly. You, know, you have this dark color shape and then the lighter color shape that he is. Yeah, and if you if they used proper spot black on that vest where the black lines are, it would be too much. Yeah, you know, it would probably still yeah, look fine but it wouldn't be as effective it, it, as what they've done and it gives it it you know it kind of runs parallel to that like shredded looking tattoo on his right arm there and just the overall shredded look that this guy has you know he, he looks like he went through a paper shredder and then was very poorly put back together with some like gauze tape yeah exactly and you're right he really does have that that Iggy Pop vibe that's just what I think. Whenever I see like a, a creepy, skinny guy with long hair like that, I'm like, Iggy Pop! But. I mean, it's always the role he plays, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, no offense to Iggy Pop, but. Although he was. He, well, he played himself in uh, Coffee and Cigarettes, that was pretty good. Oh, I don't think I've seen that one. Tom Waits, that was pretty good. But, um. Good oh. movie. Uh, what was the zombie movie he was in recently? Uh, did he do the, was that the Jim Jarmusch one also with uh, Bill Murray? And, I think uh, it was that one, yeah. I think it's Adam that Driver. one. I yes, yes it was, because they thought he was a zombie. They was like, no, I'm just old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was it. That was, uh, that, that was a fun movie. It was kind of like um, Night of the Living Dead meets Murder by Death. Yeah, I haven't had the chance to the actually big, see it yet, places. because we didn't get... Uh, like a, a very decent cinema release here. Okay. Uh, our was, our film it. board here isn't great either. If it's not a blockbuster movie, mm. it doesn't get much of a release if it gets a release at all. And horror or horror comedy getting a big release? Yeah. I It didn't get that big of a release over here either. I mean, it, it's, it was very, very much an art house kind of film, even with the bigger names in it. Uh, it packed over here because all the, the movie theaters have been closed. That was one that uh, I think it was HBO that we watched that on. It's either there or Amazon Prime where that 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 had its premiere. Yeah, I think it was Amazon uh, definitely Prime. Definitely worth checking it out, though. That that's that sounds. So yeah, I think HBO has been getting some okay stuff. I, I still haven't. I haven't even watched the original cut of Justice League, so the the new Snyder cut and all the controversy that goes with that is just something I've not 
really followed at all, but actually, no, that's not, I did see part of the new Justice League a couple years ago, so obviously not the new cut, but I, I just saw an ad for that, that that had premiered on HBO, what, three or four days ago. Yeah, I, I saw the, the original one because I got some free tickets, which I was glad that mm. I got some free tickets, because well, by the time I finished it, I was like, I wouldn't have paid for this. Yeah, so that, that's the right way, that, that, those are the right circumstances to see that one. Ironically, I actually saw it, uh, the bit that I did see was at a cabin very similar to the one in Resonant. My wife's uncle owns a place that looks a lot like the, the house these people live in, uh, up in the eastern Sierras, of, uh, kind of northern California. Uh, very, very similar setting to this. But he's got a, a, a hydroelectric plant that he built into the place, so it has a TV and uh, he has cable up there, which I don't know how he achieved that. And then there's a big stack of Blu-rays and things that you can watch when you visit. So it's very, very much glamping when we go. Yeah, I, I, I get you. Camping in the... Uh, we've got Liana in the chat and she says hello. Hey! Come on, Sammy. Uh, I just, just happened to catch, um... um David, uh, Skylar, and Leona having a chat about Jason's colors on one of the panels from the, oh, the book. Okay. I was like, come and hang out. We're talking about this right now. Yeah, there's a, a push to get him. It's just one of those things I see a lot. From yeah, the Eisner. Christian. Yes. Um, yeah, it's it's very well deserved. I mean, yeah, he's, this, I, this book alone is a, is a really... Yeah, so like, many of the books... Work, and then what he's been doing... Like, you know, that, that's exactly like, uh, right. He's on in autumnal more recently. Yes, autumnal is amazing. Um, yeah, that, that I, I can't. I'm just anxiously awaiting issue five. Me, me too. And um, I, that's actually one of the people I got to get in touch with this afternoon is scheduling with Zach because Zach is going to come on the show at some point too. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure what we're going to talk about, but whatever it is, it's going to be cool. Um, we talked about. Yeah. Uh, shoot, what's it called again? Oh man, I've just meant lost the name of it. The one with the um, fleshy cell phone and the like virtual life partner. Oh, uh, lonely receiver. Yes, that's the one. I just had one of them ADHD blanks. Could not r remember the name. Uh, that was, was what Skylar and I talked about it. last year, and it was so oh, okay. much fun. That was a really cool book. Yeah. It's, uh, remind me of that movie, um, Her, but like as this kind of body for kind of thing to it. I, I've got them all collected. That's another one I'm sort of waiting to binge. It was like they were stacking up faster than I could get to them. Yeah, yeah. So I'd read, I think, the first two issues, and then it's just been, I, I had it on, uh, on pull at one of my, one of my local shops, so I've got them all. So now it's just like kind of going through the, the stacks to try to find them all, get them in one spot, and then they can start back over at issue one and yeah, no, through the whole thing. I, I know exactly what you mean. Actually, that's that's funny because uh, funny having Leona in the chat now is that the the one that I've got to sit down and binge is the Inevitables. I got my Kickstarter rewards oh, yeah. for that like two weeks ago, I think, um, and I had Jono on the show, not last week, the week before, um, and so I've just been trying to sit down and get time to sit down and read that now because I've been waiting for it for ages. I, I love the album, so I am really keen to just sit down, blast the album, and read the book. Yeah, that's one I like. I feel really sad that I missed. Uh, there were, I mean, I love that. I love the whole thing with Kickstarter and having ADHD, though, because I'll back something and then a few months go by and I'll think, did I back that? Right. And then it's gone, and then it's a few more months go by, and then it fulfills, and like package arrives on my door, and it's this amazing comic that I had completely forgotten that I really, really wanted, and it was like, thank you, past self, you know, that I had the foresight to know what future me was going to need that day. It's just this like pleasant surprise, you know. No. You can offset them or like do do like one a month, and then you know, four or five months down the road, exactly, you're have an awesome day once a month. Yeah, that's it. Like, this year, I've got a phenomenal postal year ahead of me from 
backing as many things as I could last year so I could get to super backer. Yeah. Is that a, that's a, a Kickstarter? Yeah, yeah. Once you back a certain amount of things, you get this the super backer badge. And you know, obviously, oh, okay. before launching your own projects, having the super backer badge looks yeah. really good. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Actually, I've got one. Um, there's that uh, big hype project from Doug Wood. Have you seen that one? It's a, it's a 300-page anthology made to look like an issue of Shonen Jump. Oh, cool. Uh, I haven't seen that one. It's got a lot of... It's, uh, I've got a 20-page story in that one that I did with uh, Jared Lehan called Terminal. Uh, it's more Western-style comics. Um, and like Western in the... like Versus you know being an actual manga. It yeah. looks like a manga. And I think there are a couple of manga-type stories in there, but... It's a really broad range of stories, uh, but 300 pages of them, all black and white. Uh, Joe Donahue has a story in there. Uh, it's it's a. It's really more like who isn't in it. There's just there's so much going on in there. Yeah, you'll have to send me a link to that one after the show because I I haven't caught that one yet, but it sounds really interesting. Oh, you bet. It's only been up for a little over a week now. Um, it, it, it's secured backing, so it, it looks like it's going to be a sure thing as long as yeah, that's cool. Not everybody backs out or something, but yeah. Well, I'll definitely check that yeah, out. I'm excited then. about that one. That was. Um, yeah, it's gonna. It, it's there. There's at least, you know, there, there's, I don't know, just like a, a catalog of that much art. It's like there's there's a guaranteed good time in there somewhere. Yeah, no, I, I can understand that. I'm, I, I'll have to check it out. I'll probably back that one as well. For myself, I'm eagerly awaiting my copy of Project Stylist Daydream, the one that um, Frankie White did last year, because I've got a page in that. Liana's got two pages in that, I think. Um, and again, that's, it's just... That's another one I'm anxiously awaiting. Yeah, it's... I did back that one. Such a cool selection of creators, like 40-plus creators all up. It's going to be... I've seen who's gotten it, and just the, the previews I've seen, it, it's just a gorgeous book. Yeah, I, I decided that I'm not going to read it until I get my physical copy. Because I, I got the I PDF as a backup, nervous. but I'm just like, nope, I'm just waiting. <laughs> the other thing I'm really well known for is not uh, completing my, my Kickstarter surveys when they arrive in my email. <laughs> until long after they're due. Yep. So, like, there's a thank you page in Starless Daydream for the contributors. I didn't respond in time, so I'm not in there. Um, there's a couple of others like that. It's just... I'll, I'll just write your name happy. in the back of my one. Because I, I get, uh, I'll get an email or a DM from whoever, you know, was running the campaign a month after that survey was supposed to be. in. like, dude, can you just send me your address? <laughs> and then I, I just, we have to <laughs> just kind of, kind of phone it in. Yeah. Um, I've got the close up here of like the first time we see the other kids. Oh yeah, and like the the facial expressions are really good. And there's another page. I think it's in this issue. Also, I love this bottom right panel where um. Again, mental blank on the boy's name, the, the brother here, uh, but when he's bolting away. Oh yeah. Getting caught up here. There's a there's a involving other people in it. There's a page from issue two that's like my favorite page from the entire series so far. I'll have uh, to look. Um. Yeah, for, for some reason today, my brain has just forgotten every character's name except for Rebecca. Yeah, I, I'm, it's been a while since I've read the first issue. I've, I've read through it, I think, twice now, but it, it was really kind of trying to get myself caught up for the new ones that, as they were coming out with issue six a few months ago. Yeah. Um, jerk face here, so we could call him that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we've got... Um... This whole thing again, where they're they're trading chirpers. Yeah, it makes for a really really interesting kind of kind of currency because it's also very very dubious. You know, it's it'll let you know when a wave is coming, but 
it's not going to protect you from the wave necessarily. It's just right. You it's... have the, the the foresight to be able to tie yourself down to something, but that's about it. Yeah, exactly. And then, like here, he knows what's about to happen, so he's just like, no, nah, knocks him out and ties him up. Yeah, so and he like doesn't end up hurting him or. Exactly, and you can see that like this is not his first rodeo. He's done this before. No. And this is such an interesting thing too, because like approaching it from the standpoint that we have right now, that you know we've read all of this, we know what the the chirping represents. You know, for a first issue in reading this, you know the guy was seemed fairly nonviolent. You know, definitely sleazy, probably untrustworthy, but. Then he just starts kind of wailing on him out of nowhere. It's like yeah, I I was so confused like, but excited when I it, first read this. Yeah, it's like there's got to be a reason for this. It's not he's not just going to kick the shit out of this guy because he's there and he looks like he deserves it or something. But um, you know, you find out so much more later on. But but as a first issue kind of thing, like giving you plenty of action, promoting a lot of mystery. That was just a a really cool move. Yeah, and that's what I like, is, like, the way David's written this whole book is he gives you exactly the amount of information he wants you to have when he wants you to have it. Yes. But not no in a J.J. Abrams mystery box bullshit kind of way, either. Yeah, you know, he actually answers the questions that he asks instead of just asking more. Yeah. You know, like, he doesn't... Like lost it or pull the rug out from under you so much as he pulls the rug aside to show you the trap door underneath. Right. And this, this I keep calling it season two, but I'm mean, kind of, which is a really cool thing to do with a comic, you know, it gives the writer, the artist, everybody a break from this monthly, monthly yeah. of having to put this book together to get other things done. And um, With issue six to present, the pacing has just been, like, top-notch the scene cuts where he has them what he's leaving you with at the end of a scene and then you know, like you get this really compelling moment and then it cuts you to another scene and it feels kind of like oh i just need to know what's gonna what, what was gonna happen there but then you're into this even more compelling moment and then it just builds and builds on itself until you get to the end and it's just like ah, when's the next one coming out yeah exactly and like i say that because right here i know that we're nearing the end of this book because I've read it but I got so into this scene when it was happening I was like what's going on you know what is this all about yeah and you get to see this scene of Rebecca just being a stone cold badass and just reefing the other brother off his feet with the yeah. rope and just locking themselves down yeah and then you know that you're not going to get any kind of resolution out of it in the next page and a half. It's not like it's going to explain all of that. Exactly. And then you see... That the... if it did, it... Yeah, it, it... it would just be hitting you over the head with, with kind of mindless expository dialogue or something. Or... Exactly. And, and here in one page, not even panels, just one splash page, we sort of get to see the contrast between the dad and the daughter and what happens to someone who has control during one of these waves and someone who doesn't. Yeah. And yeah. what these waves actually do to you. And interesting here too, like you were pointing out the, you know, how he doesn't use motion lines to show these, these different actions. And then finally in this last page, he does. Yeah. And, and again, you see the, the hands. Yeah. And, and what I love again though, is like, they're not too busy. Especially the way that he does them with uh, different colors and textures rather than just solid black or solid white lines. Mm -hmm. Which, I, you know, a lot of comics just do that. They're just solid black lines or solid white lines for the motion lines. But here, and especially with the way that he lines the edges of the fingers with the same colors that he's using for the motion lines, it really yeah. pushes that feeling... The, the frantic energy of whatever is happening here. It gives you the sense that it's moving faster than anything else in the story has so far, too. Just, 
because like if, if it's you're thinking of it as like the action of a camera capturing this you know using that motion blur and that kind of effect sparingly throughout if at all you know just saving it so he can use it just once here really really emphasizes this moment doesn't cheapen it at all it's just like a perfect place to to drop the readers for that first issue and then you know of course it picks up well i wouldn't say if anybody hasn't read it yet and wants to read issue two but it yeah it gets interesting yeah um especially once we meet like the mall oh yeah yeah the mall yeah, and the preacher the, uh... yep yeah the, the the crazy religious guy with the the chain gang of followers yeah yeah that was a whole Trust thing yeah i, I haven't yeah, read in the last couple of issues yeah i haven't read eight yet but i saw what happened to the the preacher in issue seven uh that yeah. was pretty hectic <laughs> that that was yeah i i just downloaded eight uh right before we we went on um uh, david sent it to me a, a week or two ago I, i've been meaning to get into it it's just harder i've been using my ipad for for drawing so reading on it becomes uh it's like finding the right moment yeah yeah so most of the time you find me around the house with one of my volumes of the sandman which i'm going through my second read through on right now yeah but yeah this is is such an interesting book and especially like eight episodes in and we've learned so much about the world these characters are living in but also it's just raised more questions yeah. may get some light going on <laughs> <laughs> it got dark over here yeah it, it's but unlike you know like you get with tv shows where they you know they thrive on asking all these these increasingly bigger and more complex questions that in the final seasons they inevitably fail to answer or don't don't really or they half answer or they answer with another question it's like you get the answers that you need along the way but then those bring more questions and that just really keeps this thing rolling along like i can see this going kind of like walking dead it, this could probably go more or less endlessly right you know following the this family or even if they found a way to sort of pass the torch to to other characters that they needed to along the way but you know you've got a very iconic looking main character in Rebecca this you know this little girl with the the amputated leg um, and you know just the struggle that she would have with that in a normal world added to having to take care of two you know two little brothers in this uh, post apocalyptic world that's a really compelling story yeah exactly and and they definitely could go on indefinitely but if i know what i know about david and if i'm right with my guesses he's got a very specific ending already planned out and it's going to be fucking huge <laughs> I, yeah no I, that that sounds more like the reality of what this is going to end up being and i know he's got a lot of other projects lined up that he he wants to work on too uh he's been hitting at some stuff with coming coming soon with uh tim daniels Tim Daniel, sorry, I never know whether to put the S on the end or not. Um, but yeah, it's th this has been one of my my uh, my like staple books in my pull for well, really since it came out. Yeah, no, the same. I've been reading it every single issue that comes out, and you know, there's been a couple of times where David has has hit me up and on Twitter and be like, "Hey, surprise!" <laughs> And I was just yeah. like, yes, thank you. <laughs> That's always an exciting moment when I get like a preview copy or something. It's especially when that was, that was like, I dropped everything I was doing and read that one immediately because I'd been waiting since I'd, I'd finished issue five. So it had been several months and wanted to know I've been in this uh, so-called season two. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see where everything goes from here. I, for some yes. reason, my webcam has frozen on OBS Studio, but... Nope, there we go, I'm back. That was weird. It just decided to just <laughs> freeze my face for a second there. Uh, yeah, I'm really interested to see where it goes, and 
even though I know it's inevitably going to end, I am going to be really sad when it does. Because yeah. it's such an interesting world. But in saying that, like you said, you know, it might end a certain way in a certain point, but the way the, the world and the story is laid out, it leaves every possibility that if they want to come back to it later, they could come back and follow yeah. Rebecca and the little brothers. And if you find enough motivated people like, like myself and uh, Joe Donahue doing the, like the, the short that we had done within the world, just with completely different characters. Um, I mean, in, in so much as Vault or whoever wants to allow that or expand upon it with, you know, like a resident short or, you know, another, another story that world for its context, but has other, other bearings to it. Right. You know, it's a it's a very very rich kind of environment to pull from. Yeah, no, exactly. And it's going to be really interesting to see where the team goes with this, and but also where they go next, like what they do from Resonant moving onwards. Yeah, because yeah, this this is such a killer creative team. I have no doubt that there's going to be another project from this team at some point in the future. There kind of has to be. It's. It, it, I mean, there's nothing about this that doesn't work. Yeah, and, and that's just it. There's they're, Sometimes they're, you just find a team that is so perfect, they have to work together on something else. Yeah, now you see it in films all the time, too. You know, directors that just work really well with certain actors, and then it's it, it makes me think of, like, old theater uh production companies you know you have the same sort of cast of, of actors say like in a shakespearean setting doing all these shakespearean plays they're all different stories but they're all the same actors in different roles portraying yeah. those stories um i cannot think of the director's name right now to save my life but um you know silver linings playbook with uh, jennifer lawrence and um bradley cooper and uh robert de niro he came back around and he did it's called Carol. The Jennifer Lawrence plays the woman who invents the um, self ringing mop, the, the sort oh, of fabric mop. No, I'm not familiar with that one. I don't think I've even heard of that one over here. It was. It wasn't a bad movie. It. it there was a kind of a, a fatal flaw with the narrator, like almost literally a fatal flaw. Yeah. Uh, I, I I kind of dislike movies with a narrator anyway, uh, in this this the character that they chose to narrate it didn't really make any damn sense after about the first hour of the movie but um same idea though you know it was uh, that director returning with the same cast of actors to tell a completely different story with these people in completely different roles and you know it's just the chemistry is there yeah no exactly that and it's the same with like the crowded team they've done such an amazing job on yeah. that book and, like, any single member of that team and this team, if I see their name on a book, I'm going to read it. Yeah. Uh, and, and also Tim Daniel as well. Like, the plot, uh, Brent and I are planning on talking about that real soon, and it's been phenomenal. That's a brilliant book. Um, I, I'm really keen to, to finish that series and then, like, read it fresh again yeah yeah same i've got the trade on that one so i could do it all in one sitting without having to find the individual issues yeah and, and that's it it's Especially like i did with resident but... it's it's really funny with stuff like that too it's like it's not like i'm eager for a series to end but i also can't wait for a series to end so i can read it all at once yeah yeah i did that with uh I wrote a bones uh rich duex book um now, there's just a few like that. You know, you read it as it comes out monthly, and you get that, that episodic sort of sensation from it, and then getting the trade, you have the uh, the pleasure of, of the binge watch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so for me, all in all, it's a huge congratulations to both iterations of the creative team for Resonant. Yeah, especially for capturing so much of that original texture and feeling of the first five issues to carry it over you know and yeah the artists who just 
does it so seamlessly. Right, like, um, it's 100% Skylar's work, Skylar's vibe and energy, but it's also 100% resonant. Yeah, yeah, there, there's no, no question when you look at a page from it that, that that's a resonant page. Yeah, it, it's, it's amazing, because, like, I was just looking sort of at some of the art from Skylar and some of the art from this, and it is... A very, it is a different style. It's it's visual, visibly different, but there's no mistaking, this is resonant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, her work, while different to Ale's, is also the right vibe, the same vibe, and she's really captured that spirit while maintaining her own visual language, which is incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's like. Changing Darren's in that old uh, TV show, The Witch. Now it's yeah. switched from Dick York to the other guy. And it's like, sometimes it works well. Other times it's like, you have this very noticeable difference in Darren's. But uh, th this was... A... Now, even side by side, like you said, you can, you can, you can parse out the differences between the two. Um, but you really it's something you, you've got to kind of look for as well. And yeah, it's just, it's you have to be paying like, attention. Down. Yeah, and there, there's things that she brings to it that are entirely her own, like the way she does like waves and water. Or just mm. I've seen other other work that she's done in that vein on other projects and things that she's posted online, and um, it's always just like knockout stuff, like just gorgeous. Like waters like trees is flipping hard, but yeah, it it is exactly. And <laughs> again, also same thing I'm struggling with on that page I mentioned. There's a fucking waterfall, oh, yes. and there's cliffs, and a river, and I'm just like, nah. <laughs> yeah. You might have to have some kind of an intervention for Ryan. <laughs> Cut it out with the crazy space gardens. It's it's so interesting and so much fun to draw, but it's just like, why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and again, this cover is iconic. It's so good. The the, the, the original one. sort of um, purple and green toned with the with the yeah and the, the cicada. Over the lips and yeah, it's. I ended up getting a number of the variants for this one. Yeah, I want this as a poster. Cause that would be amazing. Just like this artwork, just up here. Yeah, that's it. And the Just same with like um, Skylar's accent piece. Yeah, Skylar's cover with the green face. Yeah. Yeah, I want on the one of the newer ones. Yeah, I want those two covers as posters. This issue seven one that she did with the the ship and the skull. yes, that one was really good too. Water. And the new one's got water on it too. Um, but with uh, Fern, the dog, yes. kind of struggling through a wave. Yes, Fern. Oh, my heart stops every time anything, like... I've heard I've heard David say that nothing happens to he, Fern. Yes, yes, he's promised nothing happens to the dog, but that still doesn't make it any easier. <laughs> no, it's like, because he, he could have lied. <laughs> he could have lied, or it could be like, you know... Even if she's just sad for a while, that's still heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... No, she's everybody's dog now. Yeah, she is. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, I've had a great time reading this book, and uh, I can't wait to hit the end to know the story, but I also can very much wait for this book to finish. Yeah, yeah it, it's an enjoyable experience. I think, I think that's that's the part that I'm relishing most is not necessarily wrapping, trying to figure out from what I have in my hands already how the whole thing will eventually end because it's anyone's guess at this point. But you know, enjoying the world and the story and the characters in it, and yeah, it's a it's a good one to get lost in. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, that's a pretty freaking solid effort for an episode. I'm really happy with that. We got through the whole book, and yeah. we got to talk about some other really interesting stuff, which was great. I love sort of the different tangents I go down with each guest and figuring out what that is. Yeah, um, it felt very organic. Yeah, hopefully everybody really enjoyed the, the discussion. Um, 
make sure you come back next week. I'll be talking to Minerva Fox, another collaborator on Starless Daydream. Awesome. Um, and we... Uh, what, what are we talking about? I think we're talking about Broken Bear, actually, by Frankie. Which was the okay. first of his comics that I read. Uh, and what actually started us chatting. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's really cool. Um, I'm going to drop I that in the I chat. I, he, he sent me a digital copy of that some time ago. I, I think I'll... Yeah, if you haven't read that and you're in the chat, hit that link. It's like seven bucks on Comixology and it's worth it. It's a really cool book. Uh, and we will be talking about that next week. Same time, same channel. Um, Jay, do you want to let everyone know where they can find you? Uh, yeah, uh, I have my, my website at www.jsheek.com. That's just J, my last name, S-C-H-I-E-K. Um, I'm on Twitter under the under um, at Sheikopedia. It's my last name, Apedia. Uh, same handle on Instagram. Uh, it's another. It's kind of a longer website. I, I recently had my graduate illustration show through Cal State Fullerton, and there's a big gallery of oh cool uh, work I've done in the last couple of years. And that's um, toi dot school will take you there. Uh, just click on graduates and there's uh they're using one of my rocketeer images as the the header for my, my oh, gallery I, I, wonder, I didn't get to do a, an actual show yeah i wonder if that's the one that i've seen COVID. on your twitter uh very possibly that that rocketeer stuff was fan art i started doing a year or two ago and up a lot of business uh people really like the rocketeer stuff so i I'm yeah there it is more yeah, I recognize a couple of these um, from seeing them on Twitter a while back, and I really dug those. Oh, hello. Thank you for following. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I don't know if you've been here the whole time, but we are just about to wrap up, but we'll be back with another episode next week. And, like, pretty much immediately, you'll be able to watch from the start on the VOD here on Twitch. Uh, and the edited version will be up on YouTube by Monday, once I catch up on editing a few episodes. Awesome. Um, I just dropped the, the school link in the chat as well, so go check out Jay's work on there. Um, and obviously, I am Sean Sunday. Pretty. You can find me at Brain Beast Studios pretty much everywhere. I am still Sean Sunday Art on Instagram at the moment, because Instagram is being squirrely about changing my account name, so... Go figure. Um, obviously, I have no capes every week, 10 a.m. Friday, my time. It is 10 to 12 right now, so just under two hours ago. Sky is in the chat. Thank you, Sky. Uh, wonderful having you in the chat. It was okay. wonderful having you on the show last year. Um, check out my D&D &D meets Takeshi's Castle live play show. The VOD is here on Twitch. It is also up on YouTube right now. That is The Shifting Spire. I've got a new episode every month and some amazing sponsors like Beetle and Grimm's uh, Pandemonium Emporium. Uh, Beetle and Grimm's yeah, Pandemonium Warehouse. That's the one. One of their mental blank moments. Which is, uh, if you're at all familiar, everyone, that is Matt Lillard's company. Oh, okay. Yeah, it turns out he's been playing D&D &D since he was in acting school, and now him and a bunch of his acting school buddies have a company where they create really cool, high-end D&D &D stuff. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, this is the only thing from there that I currently own, which is the Soul Coin from the Descent into Avernus adventure. And Beautiful. It's... <laughs> it's really heavy. Uh, in one of the pl promo videos they were doing for the Avernus adventure, they kept one of the bloopers in because Matt dropped one on his foot. Ah, uh, oh man. I say put that thing in a sock and you've got yourself a pretty good assault weapon. Yeah, ex ex exactly that. Um, and yeah, they make individual items that you can buy, but they also have these special edition, they call them like platinum or silver edition boxes, which has got like they grab the adventure and split it into all the different parts so that you can just have each section as on its own. And then they make limited edition minis and special maps and all the props and stuff that you need to play uh, the oh, adventure cool. that this box is for. They're not cheap, but they're really freaking cool. No, I... And one day I am going to have one. 
I'll have to check that out. I didn't know uh, Matt Lillard was into that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, then they do live streams every so often too with the staff, and they will get together and do a live stream game. It's really fun. Huh. Okay. Um, one of the owners, Charlie, uh, was on Band of Badges this morning, who are the players in my first episode of my show. Awesome. Um, and we had a great time. So what I'm going to do just before we completely go off the line is Jay and I are going to disappear. And for you guys in the chat, I am going to run the teaser for the Shifting Spire so you can get a feel for what it's all about. And hopefully tune in next month for episode two. Um, it's ten stories of different kinds of skill challenges and combats and puzzles. Um, take all of the wipe out Takeshi's Castle kind of obstacles and put spikes on them. And you've kind of got the vibe of some of it. And a new team comes through every month and the team that gets the highest by the end of the season wins the grand prize. Very cool. So it's a lot of fun and I'm in the process at the moment. I've been talking with Sky and Minerva and a couple of other people of putting together an all comics creators team for one of the episodes. Ooh. So, I'll check that out. yeah. If anyone plays D&D and is interested and you're a fellow comics creator, you know, mutuals on Twitter and all of that, shoot me a DM and we might be able to work something out. I'm trying to figure out who's interested first and then who's available on the dates and then put together a team based on that. So thank you for awesome. joining me today, Jay. It's been a pleasure to chat with you about this comic and just Thanks stuff in general. Um, yeah, this has been a great talk. I'm going to roll the trailer for the show right now, and I'll see you all next week for some more art streams and some more no capes. Bye for now. Bye, guys.